Well, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to still see people in the audience. So thank you for sticking around. This is great. It's nice to have an audience to talk to. Um, I am a sedimentary geologist, and much of my work um, focuses on understanding sedimentary environments and sedimentary uh, systems. But on the applied side of things, I do quite a bit of um, aquifer mapping. And so uh, we've been integrating hydrogeologic data, um, concepts in sedimentary geology, and airborne geophysics to try to better, better map the boundary of the High Plains Aquifer in eastern Nebraska. And that's what I'll speak to you on today. We've been fortunate in Nebraska to have uh, the support of many of our locally governed natural resources districts uh, for the funding of quite a bit of airborne geophysics work and a number of different uh, science partners along the way. So I just wanted to acknowledge them here. What we aim to uh, learn in these studies is um, from the sedimentary side of things, uh, how did these western source uh, uh, fluvial systems that dispersed the sediment to the High Plains aquifer units, which were sourced in the Rocky Mountains, interact with or become modified by um, glaciers uh, during the Pleistocene that advanced from the north uh, and east into the eastern part of Nebraska. Um, we wonder whether we can locate the edge of the aquifer uh, better using geophysics. And from a groundwater management perspective, we want to know how does the hydrogeology differ across this uh, major geomorphic boundary of continental scale significance. So the problem is that in eastern Nebraska, the High Plains Aquifer, unlike just about everywhere else in the High Plains, is concealed beneath uh, quite a lot of quaternary glacial sediment. Um, as well as a thin blanket of LUS. So the High Plains Aquifer units are juxtaposed to uh, very heterogeneous sediments. Um, this creates a problem for groundwater management as well as modeling. Um, where are these boundaries? What are the boundary conditions? How do we model them? How do we draw uh, zones around our um, management areas? And what do we do in each of those zones to, um, to better manage the water. So glacial mapping in Nebraska has really been stagnant for about 50 years. Um, early in the 30s, we began constructing maps and recognized that there were glacial deposits in the eastern part of Nebraska. By the mid 60s, researchers recognized that several drainage divides uh, appeared to be end moraines, and they began to give them names according to some of the drainages. And then by 1970, largely using um, cuttings for, from uh, drilled boreholes, several geologists mapped the thickness of what they called till in Nebraska. Um, the problem with this is that it was from rotary uh, cuttings, and just about every diamic that they found, they would call a till. And as we know, not all diamics are tills. So for the past 50 years or so, this map has been the standard for defining that glacial limit. Furthermore, these fluvial systems that distributed the sediment um, during the Neogene and into the Pliocene and Pleistocene across the High Plains um, are not very well known. Um, again, this is subsurface data. There are very few datable materials. And specifically, we don't really know much about how these fluvial systems interacted with this glacial margin um, over time. It's been very speculative. So the challenges are this pre-Illinoisan um, glacial sediment, uh, which means it's older than 600,000 years. It's very old. Um, quaternary glaciation, are modified by erosion. They're covered with LUS. We don't have the depositional landforms uh, to interpret, um, other than some of these very broad north-south trends in the drainage divides. 
really don't have many outcrops and very few core. Uh, furthermore, any hydrostratigraphic framework that has uh, been proposed or worked on really hasn't been tested using hydraulic methods. So that's what we aim to do. And generally what modelers will do is take the boundary of the High Plains aquifer shown in yellow, overlay the till thickness map from 1970, and then you're free to interpret uh, where that boundary lies and what the differences are in the, the hydrogeologic characteristics. So introduce AEM in Nebraska around 2007, and we've been conducting surveys ever since. Um, it's been really exciting to sort of uh, uh, go along uh, with all of this work um, uh, with, with Jared's group that has done a lot of work in Nebraska and uh, learn as we go. And it's, it's really been eye-opening to me as a sedimentologist. So the specific area we're going to look at is uh, right around the city of Norfolk. Norfolk. Um, and there are uh, a number of data in this area that are useful for our purposes. About uh, 12,000 line kilometers of AEM in this part of the state. Much of it is covered with a five kilometer spaced uh, grid, uh, re reconnaissance level surveys. Um, they were completed largely between 2014 and 2018. Although locally we do have some dense grids where we're able to do some 3D modeling. The hydraulic head data that we've been using comes from about 50 wells in this area, shown as the, the green circles. And these are equipped with continuous loggers, so we have some uh, long-term hydraulic head data. Um, some of our local management agencies had the foresight to go out and conduct some blitz campaigns, what they call a blitz water level campaign, where they go out and in the matter of one, one or two days, measure as many wells as they can. So we have a snapshot of the water level surface um, for, for certain time periods. We can use that to uh, contour that surface and infer some things about the hydrogeologic conditions. We have a small number of aquifer tests. I won't show those here today, but they are informative. I won't say much about the inversions uh, because I didn't do them, uh, but this is just to give you a little information about the data that we're working with. Um, two different survey systems have predominantly uh, collected most of this data, uh, the 508 and 304M systems. Um, you can see here that uh, the important part here is this vertical resolution uh, was improved significantly with that 304M system, so that has been useful for that uh, upper 50 or 60 meters or so and uh, imaging some of the glacial deposits. The approach that I've been taking is, uh, of course, my background in sedimentary geology. I look at these AEM profiles and I see sedimentary bodies. Well, how do we characterize them? We look for bounding surfaces, and that requires that we have a resistivity contrast. If we have a resistivity contrast that we can correlate from profile to profile, we can begin to quantify some of those characteristics, like the shape and the slope of the, uh, the lower and upper surfaces. We can also look at fill successions, um, which are defined both with borehole logs um, as well as the resistivity package within those bounded surfaces. Uh, so this diagram from our 2016 paper just shows a variety of uh, buried valleys that we identified in e eastern Nebraska and their different characteristics that allowed us to, to trace them around throughout a survey block. So getting right into some of the data, um, one of the sedimentary units that um, became apparent to us when we started looking at these data are these very broad, uh, low angle trough-like features filled with a, um, a heterogeneous succession coarsening upward from a uh, conductive silt and clay layer at the base up into a uh, resistive sand layer. Um, these units are apparently incised into uh, sands and gravels of the Cenozoic succession and reach down as far as the Cretaceous bedrock in this area. Um, they trend basically north northwest to south southeast for long distances. 
And nearby, we see these very um, recognizable features. These are sharp contrasts between um, conductive clay-rich diamix and resistive sands and gravels. HPA, by the way, stands for High Plains Aquifer, if you're wondering. Um, so these are the easy ones to see. Um, the truncation surface is two or three degrees, and the important thing is that it often traces down into a step, a sharp step in the bedrock surface, um, which is actually important for their interpretation. Oh, we interpret these as moraine margins. These are the really interesting ones and the ones that were really hard to figure out. Um, at first, I wanted to call these all buried valleys, but it was clear that that's not what they were. Um, we think this is a glacial tectonic complex. Uh, it's quite complex, variable. Um, we can trace out what would appear to be some imbricate stacks of low and high resistivity units. Um, very irregular contacts that may or may not correlate between sections. They also trace down into steps in the bedrock surface. And these are the easy ones to identify as well because we've looked at a lot of them, uh, these buried valleys. This one in particular, um, which is incised into a very uh, conductive diamect um, on top of Cretaceous, Cretaceous shale. High angle sides, um, lots of relief, and often filled with sands or gravels. So let's put this into geographic perspective. Our preliminary geologic interpretation is that this uh, moraine dammed lacustrine and alluvial complex is here in blue. And we think we have two of them, one trending east-west, one north-south, and that we think they are separate. Um, again, it looks something like this in cross-section. Note here that that lower unit, that lower conductive unit, impinges upon the Cretaceous shale. Um, so this is a uh, possible impermeable boundary. Here we have our moraine margin shown as the black line. Again, stands out like a sore thumb. The glacial tectonic complex shown in this cross section is always adjacent to that moraine margin, which would make sense geologically. Um, and it's continuous all the way through the study region. Finally, the buried valley. This one I think is very interesting because it begins right here where the uh, apparent moraine dammed lake ends and right where the moraine crosses over. So um, it's not too hard to figure out what might be going on here. Um, I su suspect that there were periodic breaches in this moraine dam and that we had catastrophic outburst floods funneled through this deeply incised buried valley, which is really exciting to me because this is very near my hometown area. It's a blanket of loss and I always thought the geology was quite boring looks like it's quite interesting at depth. Okay, so from a hydrogeologic perspective, um, what do some of these units mean? Well, we have the, uh, the fortune of having quite a bit of uh, hydraulic head data, and I have a student working on uh, looking through these data, and she's finding some very interesting things. Uh, one example comes from all the way down here in the southern part of the study area, you can see we have uh, about, oh, what is that? About three days worth of data here. And this is during the pumping season. There's a nearby pumping well about a kilometer and a half away. And when that well turns on, there is an immediate, like within an hour, drawdown of about eight meters. Um, after cessation of pumping, it recovers again, almost within an hour or two. And uh, really the only way you can generate this is if you have an impermeable boundary. You can model uh, this by using image well theory, especially if you put the observation well right next to the impermeable boundary and the pumping well right next to it. So this is very useful for really verifying the function of some of these uh, geologic units that we've identified. So here's where we do we've done some voxel modeling we're looking here at a model uh, looking t in the north e northwest direction through this area, right on the, the bottom. Here's where we have that bounded aquifer response in the hydraulic head data. 
And so we've toyed around with the uh, isosurface uh, function, the, the uh, 25 ohm meter isosurface seems to define well uh, this boundary between aquifer and uh, confining unit in this area. So that's been kind of interesting to, to work with that. We have additional data that uh, suggests that this area has uh, an impermeable boundary. And this is the, the contour from that blitz campaign that I talked about. We have quite a lot of well control. And this is our water level surface. Fairly uh, steady sloping surface to the southeast. And then you get this sharp step right through here and right through here. And so we can draw some boundaries in there and they correlate quite well with what we saw in uh, in the last figure. Uh, we do have a uh, quite close spacing of AEM profiles through here. This is just an example um, right through this area. So we can see the discontinuity in the water level surface uh, in the red line. If you look at the resistivity profile, you'll notice right here we have a bedrock step, this sort of sub-vertical feature um, with quite a bit of conductive material. This is right in that glacial tectonic complex. So uh, possible thrust structures in here. Okay, going all the way up to the north, uh, right up in here. This is from uh, my paper last year. Oops. And a very similar thing up here, right in the glacial tectonic complex against the uh, moraine margin. Again, a steep drawdown, slow a drawdown during pumping, and a rapid recovery. Again, this is very characteristic of a bounded, compartmentalized aquifer. Looking at some AEM profiles, guess what? We've got sort of a bullseye of resistive material surrounded by a conductor um, right in that glacial tectonic zone. So verification that these indeed are functioning as impermeable boundaries. And a final example on the um, hydraulic head data, we go over here to these um, moraine dammed lake sediments and that lower conductive unit, the silt and clay unit, uh, we wondered whether this functions as an effective confining unit. Um, and indeed it does because this blue um, hydrograph at the top is the shallow well and the shallow aquifer. Notice that it lacks any indication of the drawdown during pumping season. So uh, there's an effective confining unit separating the lower aquifer from the upper one. And again, it, where that lower unit impinges upon the Cretaceous shale, it should act as an impermeable boundary, and that's what that black line is there. And again, that profile we saw earlier, there's what we think is the impermeable boundary right there. So to conclude, um, we describe a glacial tectonic complex and moraine dammed lake deposit, which um, have never really been documented in Nebraska before. It makes sense that they're there, um, but we've really never had the means of mapping them until now. By integrating the AEM, uh, the hydraulic methods, and the sedimentary uh, geology concepts, uh, we can really improve our understanding of this pre-Illinoisian glacial history and uh, hydrostratigraphy of the, of the high plains. Um, and then finally, this uh, new boundary zone that we're working on is as much as 90 kilometers west of the mapped limit of the high plains aquifer. So this is a significant uh, change in that mapped position um, that should have important implications for groundwater modeling and, and groundwater management in this area. So thank you. <laughs>